So in 2020, you have this revelation. You recognize where this is going. You see how it charts, and you say this is going to be a real problem. Does anybody listen to you? We, this we is went, where the problem comes, right? Yeah, like we said, right? You can draw a straight line. You can have people nodding along, but there's a couple of there's a couple of like hiccups along the way. One. Is that straight line really going to happen? All you're doing is like drawing lines on charts, right? I don't really believe that that's going to happen, and that's one thing. The next thing is just imagining: is this, is this what's going to come to pass as a result of that? And then the, the third thing is: well, yeah, that sounds important, but like not my problem. Like that sounds like an important problem for somebody else. And so we did do uh, a like bit the, of a the traveling. Yeah, it was like the world's saddest traveling roadshow. Like we, it was literally as <laughs> dumb as this sounds. So, so we go and oh my god, I mean, it's almost embarrassing to think back on. But so 2020 happens. Yes, within months. First of all, we're like we got to figure out how to hand off our company. So we handed it off to two of our, our earliest employees. They did an amazing job. The company exited. That's great. Um, and, but that was only because they're so good at what they do. We um, we then went, what the hell? Like, how can you steer this situation? How do you, we just thought we got to wake up the US government. As stupid and naive as that sounds, like that was the big picture goal. So we start to line up as many briefings as we possibly can across the US interagency, all the departments, all the agencies that we can find climbing our way up. Um, we got an awful lot, like Ed said, of like, that sounds like a wicked important problem for somebody else to solve. Yeah, like defense, homeland security, and then the State Department. Yeah, so we end up exactly in this, this meeting with like, there's about a dozen folks from the State Department. And one of them, and I, I hope at some point, uh, you know, history recognizes what what she did and her team did. Because it was the first time that somebody actually stood up and said, first of all, yes, sounds like a serious issue. I, I see the argument, makes sense. Two, I own this. And three, I'm going to put my own career capital behind this. That's the... And that was at the end of 2021. So imagine that. That's a year before ChatGPT. Nobody was tracking this issue. You had to have the imagination to draw like through that line, understand what it meant, and then believe, yeah, I'm going to risk some career capital on this in a risk-averse government. And th this is the only reason that we even were able to publicly talk about the investigation in the first place, because by the time the uh, this whole assessment was commissioned, it was just before ChatGPT came out, the Eye of Sauron was not yet on this. And so there was a view that like, yeah, sure, you can publish the results of this kind of, you know, not nothing burger investigation, but you know, you can sure go ahead. And it just became, became this insane story. We had like the UK AI Safety Summit. We had the White House Executive Order, all this stuff, which became entangled with the work we were doing, um, which we simply could not have, especially some of the some of the reports we were collecting from the labs, the whistleblower reports, that could not have been made public if, there, if it wasn't for the foresight of this team really pushing for, uh, as well, the American population to hear about it. Now, can I, I could see how if you were one of the people that's on this expansion-minded man mindset, well, like all you're thinking about is like getting this up and running you guys are paying the ass, right? So, so you guys, you, you you're obviously you're doing something really ridiculous. You're stopping your company. We could be you can make more money staying there and continuing the process, but you recognize that there's like an existential threat involved in making this stuff go online. Like when this stuff is live, you can't undo it. Oh yeah, I mean like no matter how much money you're making, the dumbest thing to do is to stand by as something that completely transcends money is b being developed and it's just going to screw you over if things go badly. Right? But yeah. point is like, what is the, is there, are there people that push back against this and what is their argument? Yeah. So actually for, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you follow up on the, but there, the first story of the pushback, I think it's kind of a, it's, it's been in the news a little bit lately now getting more and more public, but um, the, when we started this and like no one was talking about it, the one group that was actually pushing sort of stuff in this space um, was a, a funding, a big funder in the area of like effective altruism. I think you, know, you may have heard of them. This is kind of a Silicon Valley group of people who have a certain mindset about how you pick tough problems to work on, valuable problems to work on. They've had all kinds of issues. Sam Bankman Freed was one of them and all that quite mm -hmm. famously. Um, so so we, we're not effective altruists, uh, but because these are the folks who are working in the space, we said, well, we'll talk to them. And the first thing they told us was, um, don't talk to the government about this. Their, their position was, <laughs> if you bring this to the attention of the government, they will go, um, oh shit, powerful AI systems, and they're not going to hear about the dangers, so they're going to somehow go out and build the powerful systems without caring about the risk side. Mm. Which, um, when you're like in that startup mindset, you want to fail cheap. Like You don't want to just like make assumptions about the world and be like, okay, let's not touch it. So our instinct was, okay, let's just test this a little bit and like talk to a couple of people, see how they respond, tweak the message, like kind of keep keep climbing that that ladder. That's the kind of you know builder mindset that we came from in Silicon Valley. And 
And we found that people are way more thoughtful about this than you would imagine. In, in, kind of... in DoD especially, DoD is actually has a very yeah. safety oriented culture with their tech. Like the thing is, because like their their stuff like kills people, right? And they know their stuff kills people, and so they have an entire safety oriented development practice to make sure that their stuff doesn't like go off the rails. And so you can actually bring up these concerns with them, and it lands in in kind of a ready culture. But one of the issues with the individuals we spoke to who were saying don't talk to government is that they had just not actually interacted with with any of the folks that they were kind of talking about and, and imagining that they knew what was in their heads and so they were just giving you know incorrect advice and and frankly like so we work with DOD now on you know um, uh, actually deploying AI systems in a way that's safe and secure and the truth is at the time when we got that advice which was like late 2020 Reality is, you could have made it your life's mission to try to get the Department of Defense to build an AGI, and like you would not have succeeded because nobody was paying attention. Wow. Because they just didn't know. Yeah, the, the, there's a chasm, right? There's yeah. a gap to cross. Like there's it's information. Cultural, yeah. yeah, there's yeah. information spaces that DOD folks like operate in and work in. There's information spaces that Silicon Valley and tech operated in. They're a little more convergent today, but especially at the time they were very separate. And so the briefings we did, we had to constantly, you know, iterate on like clarity, making it very kind of clear and, and, and explaining it and, and all that stuff. Years. That and that was the piece to your, to your question about like the, the pushback from in a way from inside the house. Mm. I mean, that was the people who cared about the, the risk. Yeah. The man, I mean, like when we actually went into the to the labs, so the, so some labs, not all labs are created equal. We should make that point. Um, you know, when you talk to whistleblowers, what we found was, there, so there's one lab that's like really great. Um, so anthropic. You know, when you talk to people there, you don't have the sense that you're talking to a whistleblower who's nervous about telling you whatever. Roughly speaking, what you know the executives say to the public is aligned with what their their researchers say. It's all very very open. More more closely, I think, than any of the others. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, more more closely than any of the others. Always, you know, there are always variations here and there. But um, some of the other labs, like very different story. And you had the sense, like we were in a room with one of the frontier labs. We're talking to their leadership as part of the investigation. And there was somebody from um, anyway, it won't be too specific, but there, there was somebody in the room who then took us aside after, and he hands me his phone. He's like, "Hey, can you please like." Put your phone number in. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Can, can you I please put, put? Yeah. Or no, yeah. He, he sorry. He put his number in my phone, and um, and then he kind of like whispered to me. He's like, "Hey, so whatever recommendations you guys are going to make, I would urge you to be more ambitious." Um, and I was like, "Like, what does that? What does that mean?" He's, he's like, "Can we? Can we just talk later?" So as happened in many many cases, we had a lot of cases where we set up bar meetups after the fact, uh, where we would talk to these folks and get them in an informal setting. Um, he shared some some pretty sobering stuff, and uh, in particular, the fact that he did not have confidence in his lab's leadership to live up to their publicly stated word on what they would do uh, when they were approaching AGI, um, and even now to secure and and make these systems safe. So, many such cases this is like kind of one specific example, but it's not that you ever had like lab leadership come in or doors getting kicked down, and people were waking us up in the middle of the night. It was that you had this looming cloud over everybody that you really felt some of the people with the most access and information who understood the problem the most deeply were the most hesitant to bring things forward because they sort of understood that their lab's not going to be happy with this. And so it's very hard to also get uh, an extremely broad view of this from inside the labs because, you know, you open it up, you start to talk to, we, we, we spoke to like a couple of dozen people about various issues in total. You go much further than that and, you know, word starts to get around. Um, and so we had to kind of strike that balance as we spoke to folks from each of these labs now when you say approaching agi how does one know when a system has achieved agi and does the system have an obligation to alert you well by you know the turing test right yes. you, yeah so you have a conversation with a machine and it can fool you into thinking that it's a human that was the bar for AGI for, you know, a few decades. That's kind of already happened. Yeah. yeah. We, like, We're close to it. Yeah. 4-0 is close to it. 4-0. Different, different forms of the Turing test have been passed. Different forms have been proposed. And mm -hmm. there is a, a feeling among a lot of people that goalposts are being shifted. Now, the definition of AGI it, itself is kind of interesting, right? Because... Uh, we're not necessarily fans of the term because usually when people talk about AGI, they're talking about a specific circumstance in which there are capabilities that they care about. So some people use AGI to refer to the wholesale automation of all labor, right? That's one. 
Uh, some people say, well, when you build AGI, it's like it's automatically going to be hard to control and there's a risk to civilization. So that's a different threshold. And so all these different ways of defining it, um, ultimately, it can be more useful to think sometimes about advanced AI and the different thresholds of capability you cross and the implications of those capabilities. But it is probably going to be more like a fuzzy spectrum, which in a way makes it harder, right? Because yeah. it would be great to have like... A, a, like a tripwire where you're like, yeah. oh, like this is this is bad. Okay, like we, you know, we got to do something. But because there's no threshold that we can like really put our fingers on. We're like a frog in boiling water in some sense where it's like, oh, like just gets a little better, a little better. Oh, like it, we're, we're still fine. We're st and, and not just we're still fine, but uh, as the system improves below that threshold, life gets better and better. These are incredibly valuable, beneficial systems. We do roll stuff out like this, um, again, at DoD and, and various customers, and it's massively valuable. It it allows you to accelerate all kinds of, you know, back office, like paperwork BS. Um, it allows you to do all sorts of wonderful things. And our expectation is that's going to keep happening until it suddenly doesn't. Yeah, one of the things that uh, there was a, a guy we were talking to from one of the labs and he was saying, look, the temptation to like put a heavier foot on the pedal is going to be greatest just as the risk is greatest because that's, you know, it's dual use technology, right? Every positive capability increasingly starts to introduce basically a situation where the destructive footprint of malicious actors who weaponize the system or just of the system itself just grows and grows and grows. So you can't really have one without the other. The question is always, how do you balance those things? But in terms of defining AI, it's, it's a challenging thing. Yeah, that's something that one of our friends at the lab pointed out. The closer we get to that point, the more the temptation will be to hand these systems the keys to our data center because they can do such a better job of managing those resources and assets. And if we don't we do can. it, Google will. And if they don't Bingo. do it, Microsoft will. Like the competition, the competitive dynamics are a really big part of this, this issue. Yes. So it's just a mad race to who knows what. Exactly. Yeah. That's actually the best summary I've heard. I mean, like no one knows what the magic threshold is. It's just these things keep getting smarter. So we might as well keep turning that crank. And as long as scaling works, right, we have a knob, a dial, we can just tune and we get more IQ points out. What, from your understanding of the current landscape, how far away are we looking at something being implemented where the whole world changes? Arguably, the whole world is already changing as a result of this technology. Uh, the U.S. government is in the process of task organizing around various risk sets for this. Um, you know, that that takes time. Uh, the private sector is reorganizing. Like, it, it, OpenAI will roll out an update that, you know, obliterates the jobs of illustrators from one day to the next, obliterates the jobs of translators from one day to the next. This is probably net beneficial for society because we can get so much more art and so much more translation done. But is the world already being changed as a result of this? Yeah, absolutely. Geopolitically, economically, industrially. Yeah. Of course, it's like not to say anything about the value, the purpose that people lose from that, right? So they, they right. Kind of, there's the economic benefit, but there's like the social cultural hit that we take too. Right. And then there's the implementation of universal basic income, which keeps getting discussed in regards to this. We asked chat, uh, chat GPT 4.0 the other day in the green room. We were like, uh, you know, are you going to replace people? Like, will, what will people do for money? And then, well, universal basic income will have to be considered. Well, you don't want a bunch of people just on the dole working for the fucking Skynet. So you look at, for example, GPT-40 has one uh, mistake that it used to make quite recently where if you ask it, um, just repeat the word company over and over and over again. It will repeat the word company. And then somewhere in the middle of that, it'll start. It'll just snap. It'll just snap and just start saying like weird. I forget like what the. Oh, it's like, talking about itself, how it's suffering. Like it yeah. depends on, it uh, varies yeah. from, from case to case. It's suffering by having to repeat the word company over again? Um, so this is called, it's called rant mode uh, internally, or at least this is the name that uh, they One use. of our... Yeah. Yeah, one of our friends uh, mentioned. There is an engineering line item in uh, at least one of the top labs to uh, beat out of the system, this behavior known as rent mode. Now, rent mode is interesting because existentialism sorry existentialism is the, this is one yeah. kind of rant mode yeah sorry so when we talk about existentialism this is a kind of rant mode where the system will tend to talk about itself uh refer to its place in the world the fact that it doesn't want to get turned off sometimes the fact that it's suffering all that that oddly is a behavior that 
emerged at, as far as we can tell, something around GPT-4 scale, yep. and then has been persistent since then. And the labs have to spend a lot of time trying to beat this out of the system to ship it. It's literally like it's a KPI or a, like an engineering a line item in the engineering like like task list. We're like, okay, we gotta we gotta reduce existential outputs by like X percent this quarter. Like that is the goal. Um, because it's a convergent behavior, like, or at least it seems to be empirically seems, with a lot of these models. Yeah, it's hard to say. And you have an AI system that is able to transcend our own attempts at containment, which which is an actual thing that these labs are thinking about. Like, how do we contain a system that's trying to specialize? Do they have testing? containment of it currently? Well, right now the systems are probably too dumb to like, you know, want to be able to break but out. Why, on the road, but, but then why are they suffering? This brings me back to my point. When it says it's suffering, do you quiz it? It's so th that's the thing. It's writing that it, that it's suffering, right? Yeah. It's. Is it just embodying we, life is suffering? Well, we we can't actually. So these things are are trained. Actually, this is maybe worth flagging. So, um, and and by the way, just to kind of put a, a pin in what I was saying there, there's actually a surprising amount of quantitative and empirical evidence for what he just laid out there. He's actually done this, some of this research himself, but there, there are a lot of folks working on this. It's like, it sounds insane. It sounds speculative. It sounds wacky, but this is, this does appear to be kind of the default trajectory of, of the, the tech. But so in terms of, yeah, with these weird outputs, right? What, what is, what does it actually mean? If an AI system tells you I'm suffering, right? Does that mean it is suffering? Is there actually a, a moral patient somewhere embedded in that system? Um, the training process for these systems is actually worth considering here. So. You know, what is GPT-4 really? What was it designed to be? How was it shaped? Um, it's one of these artificial brains that we talked about, um, massive scale. And the task that it was trained to perform is a glorified version of text autocomplete. So imagine taking every sentence on the internet roughly, feed it the first half of the sentence, get it to predict the rest, right? The theory behind this is you're gonna force the system to get really good at text autocomplete. That means it must be good at doing things like completing sentences that sound like, uh, to counter a rising China, the United States should blank. Now, if you're going to fill in that blank, right, you'll find yourself calling on massive reserves of knowledge that you have about what China is, what the U.S. is, what it means for China to be ascendant, geopolitics, economic, all that shit. So text autocomplete ends up being this interesting way of forcing an AI system to learn general facts about the world, because if you can autocomplete, you must have some understanding of how the world works. So now you have this myopic, psychotic optimization process where this thing is just obsessed with text autocomplete. Maybe, maybe, assuming that that's actually what it learned to want to pursue. We don't know whether that's the case. We can't verify that it wants that. Embedding a goal in a system is really hard. All we have is a process for training these systems. And then we have the artifact that comes out the other end. We have no idea what goals actually get embedded in the system, what wants, what drives actually get embedded in the system. But by default, it kind of seems like the things that we're training them to do end up misaligned with what we actually want from them. So the example of company, 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 right? And then you get all this like wacky text. Okay, clearly that's indicating that somehow the training process didn't lead to the kind of system that we necessarily want. Uh, another example is take a text autocomplete system and, and ask it, um, I don't know, uh, how should I bury a dead body, right? It will answer that question. It, or at least if you frame it right, it will autocomplete and give you the, the, the answer. You don't necessarily want that if you're open AI, because you're gonna get sued for helping people bury dead bodies. And so we've got to get better, like better goals basically to train these systems to pursue. We don't know what the effect is of training a system to be obsessed with text autocomplete, if in fact that is what it is happening. It's also, yeah, we... So I still don't understand when it's saying suffering, are you asking it what it means? Like what is causing suffering? Does it have some sort of an understanding of what suffering is? How, what is suffering? Is suffering emergent sentience while it's enclosed in some sort of a digital system? 